What, I share, what I'm going to share with you this afternoon, um, I just learned a couple months ago, a few months ago. I was down in Venezuela, and my, one of my teachers down there came up to me and said, Pastor Gates, who is the bride of Christ? And I said, well, the church is. Everybody knows that. And he said, are you sure? Well, I'm pretty sure. You better go back and study again. Well, I promptly went to my computer and I typed in the word bride in the Bible. And immediately I came up with a few of them. Some of them were actual weddings. But the one that interested me was in Revelation. Revelation 20, 21, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That didn't seem to shed too much light on it. Surely Jesus is not going to marry a city. And so I thought, that has to be symbolic. Nobody is going to marry a city. Now, I met a friend of mine who said he loved his computer just about as much as he loved his wife. I thought I'd have some stupid friend of mine. <laughs> but I couldn't imagine Jesus marrying a city. So I knew it had to be a symbol for something. Would you agree with me so far? Because Jesus is not going to marry walls and cement or gold even. There has to be something more. So then I looked up New Jerusalem. And I ended up coming back to Revelation 3. The very same part that I had read to you. And beginning from verse 7 down to verse 13, we're discussing that it's, a le it's the, the letter to the church of Philadelphia. Now, I'm going to tell you what my conclusion was ahead of time, and then I'm going to try to prove it to you. Okay? Instead of leading you to the conclusion, I'm going to tell you right off. First of all, I'm going to tell you that... I believe that the last church before Jesus comes will not be Philadelphia, and it will not be Laodicea, it will be Philadelphia. And I'm going, to, I'm going to show you why. First of all, let me ask you some questions. How many of you think the church of Laodicea, which is today, can be saved in the condition of Laodicea? Nobody. No. In that condition of lukewarmness, it causes nausea, you know. Because it says here, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I do remember when I was a little boy, my dad was a missionary pilot, and in Bolivia there was a lot of cattle. And in this airplane, my dad had two cattlemen. And he was taking them, I was in the back with one of them, my dad was up front with the other, in the co-pilot seat. And I was riding in the back, and I heard my dad ask, he asked him, he said, excuse me, he asked the, the, the man next to him, do you know how to ride wild bulls? And in Bolivia we call them chucaro. <laughs> Do you know how to ride chucaros? Oh, pastor, he said. I'm a macho. I ride big chucaros. He said, see if you can ride this one. And my dad started doing this with the airplane. <laughs> the guy started turning green. And I looked at the guy next to me and he was like this. You know what that means? He was desperate. He didn't know where, but he spotted the hat on top of his friend's head. <laughs> so he took the hat off and he <laughs> filled it all up. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was made out of woven grass and it started to filter out. <laughs> so, my, so he said, help, help. My dad looked back, he saw the problem, opened up the window of the airplane and said, throw it out. So he grabbed the whole hat and he threw the hat out, but the wind blew it all back in. <laughs> All over on top of us. I'm still traumatized to this day. <laughs> Nausea. Terrible thing. Lukewarmness is a terrible thing to God. It makes him nauseated. And unfortunately, that's our condition. We stand with one foot in the world, and we stand with one foot in the church, one foot hot, one foot cold, and we say... We're doing fine. I'm a good a member in good and regular standing. I carry responsibilities. Everything is okay. Not 
like the young people would say today. Unless both feet are hot or both feet are cold, the condition of lukewarmness causes nausea to God and he will vomit. So he, he, he invites, come, I stand at the door and knock, let me in and I will teach you, I will eat with you and if you overcome, you will sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat with my father on his throne. But the condition of Laodicea will not go through to the end because the last church will not be Laodicea. Laodicea says, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, not knowing that you're pitiful, poor, blind and naked. So I thought to myself, what's going to happen to, La to Laodicea? Well, when, God, when that engineer handed me the piece of paper with Revelation 3.8 on it, he got my attention focused. And I kept on reading. And then when this guy, this professor down there, one of our teachers says, who is the bride of Christ? I started looking, and lo and behold, I ended up on the same message to Philadelphia. Let's go, go through it with me. We'll do it pretty fast. And we're going to look at every, every verse of this thing and take a little conclusion. Verse 7, chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy. It's a holy church he's looking for. He that is true. A church that preaches the truth. That is, cares about the truth. Not just playing a game. Truth is important to this people. Amen. He that hath the key of David. He that opens and no man shuts. And shuts and no man opens. Well, when I read my name there, I really get encouraged. Because if God has my key, it's okay with me. Now, if he has my key, he has your key, by the way. Any problem you can get into as you obey God, God has the key to that solution. Doesn't matter what the problem is. He has the key of David. Now, if you look up the key of David and do more research, you find that we're talking also about judgment and about looking for a people that are being purified and that are standing holy before God. But just the opening chapter says we're looking about holiness and truth. And a God who opens and no man can close. And when he closes, it's too late to go in. Verse 8. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door and no man can shut it. Because I know you have only a little strength. But you have kept my word and not denied my name. God is looking for people today that believe his promises. That says, God is able he said he would, he will do it. And you do not deny his name. Hold up his name and say, God is able. He never, th that. you know, I, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine very high up at the general conference, and he told me, David, there's a couple of people that have complained to me about your philosophy of miracles. They call it miracle theology. I said, boy, you're getting on dangerous territory. Because if you call the ability of God to do miracles a theology, and then you hold it up, and then you chop it down, you're in deep water, because unless you believe in the God of miracles, you cannot survive the future. What are you going to do when all human support is cut off? What about the latter rain experience that God provides all the resources and power to finish the work? If you think you can do it on your own, and you don't believe in a God of miracles, I really feel sorry for you. But it is not a theology, I said. It is my belief that God will do what he says. It's not, it's not, a theology is kind of a system of interpretation of Scripture. This is not interpretation. God said he would do it, he will. It's hardly a theology. He said, well, David, some people are very uncomfortable because you always talk about miracles. I said, praise the Lord, man. What would I do without that? I will not back down on that one. If some people don't want to talk about miracles, then they can serve a God of no miracles. Not my God. I'm sorry. I don't want to serve a God that cannot do miracles because unless God is able to pull us through and provide for us, we're in the wrong boat. This is just a game. It becomes an Adventist club. No wonder some of those same critics want an evangelical Seventh-day Adventist church like everybody else. They don't, want to, they don't want to preach the message. They don't want to focus on our mission. They just want another church out there that's like everybody else. And if that's the case, we don't need a Seventh-day Adventist church. There's already too many out there already. I'm not interested. Sorry. I believe in a God who says he will keep his word and I will stick with it. I don't care if I die. I have already seen it. I don't have time to, because of the time, I don't have time to look at it up. It's in, in early writings. I think page 20 to 19 to 20. Somewhere in that area. Anyway, 
Sister White as was taken by an angel through heaven and was shown the condition of the church. And she said, why don't God's people have more faith? Why don't they have, see God's power? And you know what the angel said? Because they let go too soon of the arm of God. If they would just hang on to the arm, they would see their promises fulfilled. Amen. Well, in that case, I learned something. I said, well, I'm never going to let go then. I don't care if a month goes by, a year goes by, 18 months go by, I'm sorry, God will pay for the network. Amen. Did he? Amen. Yes. Oh, but David, now you signed another contract. He hasn't paid for that one. Oh, come on, this, this is not a game. He's going to pay for every one of them. Yes. And I'm not going to let go. Because the problem that we don't receive more power and miracles from God is because we let go. Well, God can't do it. I don't think he wants to anymore. I've waited a month already. I'm giving up. The angel said, if you refuse to let go, you will see the fulfillment of God's promises. So I encourage you not to let go. Even if you go through difficult times. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him, said Job. Learn to trust him like that. Even if I die, even if I don't see the fulfillment, God will fulfill it. And your eyes will see the fulfillment. Verse 9. Behold, I will make them that which are the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, but they are not, but do lie. I will make them to come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you. Uh, it says Jews here. Are we talking about literal Jews or spiritual Israel? Spirit. Behold, I will make them which are of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Seventh-day Adventists, but they're not. They're lying. Ah, that makes it a little more at home, doesn't it? Did you know that the Seventh-day Adventist church, inside the church, the synagogue of Satan is operational? Huh? If some days you wonder why people act the way they do, and why there can be such opposition to God's work, don't be surprised. Satan's church is fully operational inside the church. Don't be surprised. Now, I'm not telling you this so you can go around and say, let me see who's in the synagogue. There's one, there's one. No. <laughs> the reason I'm telling you this is so you can examine your own soul. Just make sure you're not one. Just make sure you do not work for the enemy. Amen. And how can you know that? You, you make God your first loyalty, the mission of the church that he gave you, his first loyalty. Higher than any other loyalty is your loyalty to the mission that God left for you to do. Amen. It's nice when people agree with you. But on the other hand, not everybody will agree with you. In fact, there's a Romanian saying, the skin of a man with no enemies is not worth two cents. So if you're doing what God wants you to do, you will find people that don't agree with you. you just get used to it. That's the condition of the church. We have a polarization happening. People are choosing sides right now. All over, from the highest level to the bottom, people are choosing sides. Don't just think it's happening at the pew only. Pastors and administrators are choosing sides too. And the synagogue of Satan has people represented at all levels. So does God. Just be sure you're on the right side. Okay? Enough said on that. The implication is pretty clear. It's gone. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon them that dwell upon the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. There is a temptation coming. It's going to try everybody. It says, to try them that dwell upon all the world. It's going to test every single person. But, except one group. This group right here. Because you have kept the word of my patience, or should I say it, because you have patiently kept my word, I will keep you from that hour of trial. When all the world is struggling, should I trust God or should I go with man? Should I follow God's commandments or should I follow man's commandments? This group isn't going to have to deal with that problem. They've already made their decision during the good times. They made their decision in December of 2006. So when a crisis comes soon after, they don't have to be tempted. They've already made their decision. They don't wrestle with the issue. The issue is not an issue for them. They already trust God. They put their trust there and they can see that he's been faithful. They will not wrestle with it. That's why he said, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from that hour. What a wonderful promise. I'm looking forward to that. The rest of the world will have to wrestle. People inside the church that never made their decision will have to sweat blood on that one. But not you, if you make your decision today. Amen. Verse 11. And this is one reason I believe 
that Jesus is going to come with a Philadelphia message. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which you have, that no man take your crown. There's the first hint that Jesus is coming in this period. He tells this group only, hang on, I'm coming quickly. But because there's a tempest coming, the hurricane is going to try to blow the hurricane and the, what are the other words that they use for a hurricane? Uh, cyclones and... I don't, there's one other word I was looking for. <laughs> okay. There, there's some severe weather coming, okay? There's some severe, severe weather coming and it's going to take, blow your crown off. Hang on to it because somebody else will get it if you don't. It's going to take an, a, an effort on your part to hang on to what you believe. Because if you don't, boom, your beliefs are gone. Why will somebody steal your beliefs? What is coming upon the earth? There's a trial coming. And if you're not well founded and you don't know what you believe and you don't know why you believe it and you don't know if you want to believe it, I can guarantee you right now, no crown for you. Because once you lose your beliefs, there's no crown attached to non belief. You see how important it is? The most important education a young person can have today is missionary education. Yes. Absolutely. If our schools do not produce missionaries, they're not preparing our young people for the crisis ahead. A, a piece of paper, and God has given me a lot of pieces of paper. It's nice to have a good education in a lot of different areas, but it's totally irrelevant when compared with preparing for the crisis ahead. The very first priority of parents with their children or of any young person in acquiring education, am I well cemented to be a missionary leader for God during the crisis? Amen. Once you have that down, you can study other things. And you need to get an experience, young people. Go to where you can get an experience. Become a leader for God, because it's not by qualification of man-made institutions, it's by qualifications of the Holy Spirit and your experience with God. Amen. Then, acquiring other educational things can be a benefit. Because if you don't know where you're going to begin with, What's the use of a piece of paper? Only if you get an education to help carry out the mission is a piece of paper worth anything because a piece of paper can ruin you. If it qualifies you to serve self, you're dead meat. Education, true education, prepares you for service. And once you've committed to service and you get an education, you can be a great blessing to the world. Let's go on. Don't let anybody take your crown. And verse 12 is kind of like the epitome of everything. Listen very carefully. This is, where the, the, this is where I solved my problem. Now, I was afraid to share this. You know, have you ever been afraid? What if they say I have new light? So I shared it with my theology friends in Romania, and they're very conservative there. And they said, this is wonderful. Share it with the church. Are you sure? Yes. So I shared it with the church, and they loved it. Then I went to the seminary in Puerto Rico. They asked me to have the weekend there at, at, at the university just a, a month and a half ago, two months ago, and I shared it with everybody. They loved it. I shared it in Bolivia, shared it in Venezuela. They said, you know what? This is wonderful. The feedback from the people is wonderful. I was scared, you know, because I'm, not, I'm, I'm known for my faith in God and trusting Him. I'm not known for being a theologian that's discovering new truth. <laughs> but let me share it with you, right? Probably one thing we do know for, by the way, is that God, Sister White says, when we properly understand Daniel and Revelation, there will be a revival and reformation in God's church will, which will prepare us for the soon coming of Jesus. So there's a lot of things about Daniel and Revelation we are still to learn, but it will build on top of the light we already have. It never destroys the pillars, it builds on the pillars. That's why we can know it's good light. Let me share what I have with you. You can make your own decision. So far, it's 100% batting. People just, I shared it in Philippines with all of the, the division administration, union administrators there, I shared it. And they told me what a blessing it was. I hope it's a blessing to you. Let me share it right here. Read carefully with me. Verse 12. To him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Okay. Now remember, we're talking about the last generation, right? To him that overcometh, God will make a pillar. Do you think he's going to make a cement pillar, marble pillar, gold pillar? Or are we talking symbolic? Make a permanent fixture in the temple of my God. Okay? You will be permanent. A pillar, just like a pillar in a church. Okay? Now, it says, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go in and out no more. In other words, you live there. This is your home. You won't have to say goodbye anymore. 
you, you live there, you're a permanent fixture. If you go in and out, you're always coming back there. You won't have to say goodbye, see you tomorrow. Okay? And I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is a new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Now, immediately, I thought to myself, where in Scripture can I find out which group of people has the name of God written on their forehead? Revelation 14. And lo, I looked upon the Mount Zion, a lamb stood upon the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Are you following me? Yes. This group of people that God is going to make a fixture in a temple have the name of the Father, the New Jerusalem, and the name of the Son. Then I'm saying, oh, if I'm seeing a picture, the New Jerusalem is not the city. This people has the name New Jerusalem on their forehead. So then I decided to go to the Spirit of Prophecy to see how it compared with this. And I found some very interesting things. One is, Sister White said, many are invited to the banquet. Would you agree with that? But if you're invited to the banquet, she says, you are not the bride. I was in Romania recently. I had a wedding. I married a couple. We had a beautiful reception. I love Romanian food. And after the reception, the, the bride and groom just took off and they didn't even invite me to go along. <laughs> I don't know how to do it here in Australia. You know, I've learned very fast. I might be the pastor that married them, but I'm not the bride. The, the bridegroom took off with his bride and didn't take anybody else that was invited. Sister White says, if you're invited and you're an invitee to the banquet, you cannot be the bride. Because the bride is not the invited one. The bride is doing the inviting. And the bridegroom. Isn't that interesting? I thought everybody who was there was going to be the bride. But evidently not. Evidently the mass, the, big, uh, the great multitude which comes to the banquet of the, of the, bri of the groom, or of, the, of, the, of the lamb, they're invited. But then who's going to be the bride? Well, I kept on looking, and I read in early writings where Sister White was walking with many of the redeemed ones through the, a beautiful forest. She saw many people with little red, red uh, hymns on the bottom of their garments, many children. And she said, who are they? And Jesus said, those are those who, who gave their life as martyrs. And they kept walking, and eventually they came to the temple, a beautiful temple. And Jesus raised his lovely voice and said, only the 144,000 can enter here. Doesn't that shed a little bit of light on this? Who do you think lives in this temple? Those that have the name of God, the Father, the New Jerusalem, and the, Holy, and, and, the, and the Son written on their foreheads. And who is that group? Obviously the 144,000. And then I learned some more. She says, Jesus was standing in the most holy place where he is today. And when every case had been decided, he said, wait here. I must go receive the kingdom from my father. He goes to his father and he is married with the new Jerusalem. God the father performs the wedding. He says, son, I declare you husband and wife. Go get your bride. And while you're there, bring back all the invited ones too. Now, I added that last little bit. I'm just saying... He's married. Sister White said he's married to the New Jerusalem. Now, not to the city. We now know the New Jerusalem is a people. And who is the New Jerusalem? Sister White clearly says that the 144,000 have the name New Jerusalem written on their forehead. Amen. So all of a sudden, we're understanding something a little different. You see, the 144,000 is the bride. And they follow the Lamb everywhere he goes, says Revelation 14.5. In eternity, planet X receives a notice. The creator of the universe will come on October 4 to visit you. They prepare for years. And finally the day comes. All of a sudden, I mean, the whole planet is waiting for the visit of the creator, God. And here comes the, here comes the Son of God. Coming down, the angels form a, uh, a, an opening 
And there he is. And as he comes, guess who is with him? His bride. You see? For, for out, throughout eternity, not just on this earth, throughout eternity, wherever Jesus goes, he's taking his bride with him. Why would he be separated? Why, why would you want to be separated from your bride ever again? I'm thankful my wife would come. She didn't come with me in April, and sometimes she can come. But to the grateful invitation of people here in Australia, they said, next time, please come with your wife. We would like to help pay for her ticket. And so we came together this time. So much fun. So much more fun than being separated. And Jesus has been separated a very long time from his bride. 2,000 years since he paid with his own blood. And he can't wait to get married. And can you imagine the glory? He's not just coming down to pick up his people. He's coming down to get his bride. And all of the other invited ones too. Come, celebrate the banquet between me and my wife. There are 44,000. What a beautiful invitation. And guess what? The 144,000 come from a people who have the commandments of God, who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. They come from the Seventh-day Adventist church. Amen. Now, God may have other people who keep his commandments out there that are not Seventh-day Adventists. That's true. It may happen. There could be others that keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. It's just not part of our fold, and we don't know, and they don't know. Because there are other denominations that also keep the Sabbath. We don't know that. But this is God's people, final remnant church. And this is where he will choose his bride from. And that's why it is so important for Satan to prevent you from waking up. Because if you wake up and realize the calling, you just might accept. And if you accept, God might complete the number that he's looking for. Now, I don't know if the number 144,000 is literal or symbolic. I tend to think it's probably literal, but it could be symbolic. Only time will tell. It's still a small group. It's the first fruits. It's a small people. Hey, by the way, it happens to be only 1%. You know, Gideon got 32,000 volunteers and God narrowed it down to 300. 320 would have been exactly 1%. But God also needs 1%. There's 15, 14 and a half to 15 million Adventists on the church books. And 1% is 144,000. We are at the absolute moment in time with 1%, God's coming to get us. Because once he has a 1% ready, he's not going to wait any longer. He's coming. Because waiting only makes him lose more people. The world is already ripe. It's ready right now for the harvest. Except God's people are not sealed yet. And if you read Revelation 6, 7, the angels, the four angels are holding the winds of strife until the servants of God are sealed on their foreheads. As soon as they're sealed, the angels will release the winds of strife. And I would like to suggest to you, the angels already are releasing the winds of strife. That means the process is almost finished. One of these days soon, we will know who they are. And we must strive to be among them. It's not for us to say, you, me, her. no. It's, it should be our joy, our passion. Lord, I want to learn to follow the Lamb today. Because I want to follow you throughout eternity. Seal me, teach me, train me, discipline me, whatever it takes, but count me in. I don't want to be out. And if God's people, the Seventh-day Adventists, do not understand this message, there are many that will not be able to be ready. And therefore, Jesus has to wait because he's not coming without his bride. You think Jesus is going to come with no bride? No. It cannot happen. Jesus will have a bride and he will come to get her. A purified, sealed church. Amen. And it's almost over. We don't know who they are yet, but Sister White says someday we know, we'll know. Do you have the passion to be part of that group? Amen. Do you have the desire deep in your heart to say, Lord, whatever it takes, train me, but I want in. Amen. Many are called, but few choose to accept. This message today is a solemn one. But it goes to show why Seventh-day Adventists so desperately need to understand their mission and their calling. You have the final message for the world, and we cannot take it to the world until we're sealed 
Because when the Holy Spirit has a seal, when the people are sealed, the Holy Spirit will be poured out and that message will explode across the earth. It doesn't take a long time to take a message to the earth. With television today, every network carrying it, good or positive, it doesn't matter. The whole world can know about it. When, do you remember Waco, Texas? Some of you? I remember when I, I heard on National Public Radio, I was listening in the United States, and I heard the announcer say, David Koresh and a group of people called the Davidian sect branch are there, and they're a part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. All of a sudden, my stomach got real tight, and I said, how in the world will we ever defend ourselves? The General Conference got busy right away and said, well, 70 years ago, they branched off as a sect, and then it, 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 we have nothing to do with them. And they sent National Public Radio made a slight little comment about it, never did clarify very well. If you want to go to Waco, Texas today and do evangelism, you're in trouble. Nobody wants to listen to you because they consider that you to be part of that same group if you're a Seventh-day Adventist. The doors will close. Many doors are open today. They will welcome you with arms. I have a Seventh-day Adventist. Why? This is wonderful. But as soon as the message goes out, the doors will close. Right now is the time, and right now is our choice. So I would like to invite you today, deep in your heart, this is a very private choice. I will not ask you to come forward. That's between you and God. God is looking for people that are willing to go all the way and follow him now so that they can follow him throughout eternity. It's a wonderful privilege. There can be no higher privilege than living in the presence of God throughout eternity. Now, I could say to myself, all I want is a little corner of the universe. I just want a little house on a little river beside a great waterfall. But for what my humanist tells me, but David, you don't want to live in a city. You don't want to live in a temple because you don't like cities. You like the jungles. But I haven't tasted it. Only once I read a story about a young Russian man. He was being tortured for his faith. He was a soldier. And they tortured him. I don't know if you've ever read the book Vanya. If you ever find the book called Vanya, this young Christian man stood up for God in the Russian army until they killed him. And the angels walked with him. They walked beside as he was walking to the torture chamber. As they were taking him in to put his foot, lock his foot up in an ice box. As they put him all night long in a cold refrigerator dripping of water. As they as they did things, as they, as they punctured him, as they, as they shocked him, as they tried to drown him. I can't even imagine such diabolic things. But the angel walked with him and told him, stay firm. God will be honored by you. And he intervened so many times in this young man's life. But one day, just before he was killed, the moment that they turned off the lights, an angel was standing by his side and said, I have come to get you. God wants to show you what you're about to inherit, so you will be strong. And they went shooting out to the roof, and they were gone all night. <laughs> and the moment he came back, I'll tell you what he saw in a minute. The moment his feet touched the ground, boom, the lights came on, and it was morning time. And all his friends says, where were you? We looked for you throughout the barracks. You were nowhere in sight. <laughs> and suddenly the lights came on, and there you were standing by your bed. He said, I was gone all night. The angel physically took him. They went through the universe and went to what he was told was heaven. He went down a deep canyon and the angel said, you cannot see the new Jerusalem with your own eyes because you will be destroyed. But I will take you into a deep canyon and you will get an idea of some of the glory by looking up and just seeing some of the reflections of the light. And he said he could see something very bright on top of the canyon and the light was bouncing off and he's like liquid light. And the light, you know how you shoot water with a hose and it bounces off everywhere? He said some of those rays of light would bounce off the canyon walls and every once in a while, a little bit would hit you. And the moment that light hit you, it was like glory, just absolute ecstasy. Can you imagine living in that glory? So I thought to myself, my little house on a river. Living in the presence of God is like living in absolute ecstasy 24 hours a day. Who would want to live anywhere else? And God is calling you to be part of that. Amen. It's your invitation. You can take your mind off of these solemn things and focus them on the world and almost imagine things are normal. You can go to work and kind of forget there's another world out there. 
Jesus kept his eyes focused on the beyond what he could see with his eyes. He knew what the great controversy was about. The devil said, I'll give you all of this if you kneel down and worship me. And he knew that if he just hang on a little, hung, hung on a little longer, it was all his anyhow. He did. And as he died, he told his father, I trust you. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he died looking beyond the grave. His cold body lay there. His lips sealed. Torn lips, no doubt, where he was hit. And suddenly, on Sunday morning, a mighty angel flashed down from heaven and the light scattered everything. And when the angel said, Son of God, thy father calls thee, come forth. Instantly, Jesus took his life back again. There was a smile that crept across his face. You know what that smile was? I knew I could trust my father. Hmm? There was no appearances of that when he died. All the appearances were that it was a total failure, a miserable death on a miserable planet. But he smiled and he said, I knew I could trust my father. And he smiled. He took off that sheet and he folded it and he said, it's conquering time. And he told his disciples, all power is given to me on heaven and on earth. Go therefore and baptize them teaching him to observe everything I've commanded you and baptizing him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Tonight, we have that same invitation. We might suffer some stripes. We might suffer some difficulties. But keep your eyes focused on the Lamb. Amen. He's conquering. And he's coming in great power. Keep that smile on your face. It's a done deal. Let's go forward in that mighty power. All power and all authority is given to me on the heaven and earth. He's in command. The nations and all the things you're seeing have to first be approved by God before God allows it. If God has to change a government in order to allow you to finish the mission, He will change the government. If God's people need to have a, a, an earthquake for something to be successful, God will do the earthquake. If He needs a whole change in government, if He needs the resources to pour out from heaven like gold diamonds raining, raining from heaven. That's not a problem for God. Whatever you need, you will have. But it takes total commitment. There's no halfway. And then he will come and we will say, this is our God. We knew he would come to save us. Amen. What a beautiful thing. I, I want to be there. Amen. Even Sister White was not told she would be saved. She said, if you're faithful, you will, be, you will be here. So I'd like to say, let us choose tonight to be found faithful. Amen. Let us make that choice every day. Let us put ourselves in God's hands. And whenever you have a difficult situation, don't say, Lord, get me out of the difficult situation. Say to yourself, I know what you're doing. You're trying to train me, aren't you? This is difficult and painful, but I understand. I gave myself to you for, the, for training in the Olympics, and you're making me jump the bars, aren't you? Thank you, Lord, for trusting me. Thank you for taking me through this problem. I choose to trust you no matter what. And once you pass one, they'll take you to another one and another one. And each time reinforcing the faith until finally you can say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Amen. May God bless you. I would like to ask you to kneel where you are. Let's have a prayer commitment together. Should we? Oh, Lord. As we look on the solemn events that are happening in this world,